How many? Well, I think I can take uh, five gallons. Going on to Dover. How far is it? About 30 miles. There uh, must have another tank, too, fool. Taking the night ferry. That's right. Tomorrow morning, I drive off the quay in France. Start your holiday early in the morning in another country, and you get a feeling of, well, you know, freedom. There's nothing like it. You can do with a bit better weather, then. Real old English summer we've had. <laughs> Look at it now. You know, it wasn't raining when I left London. You don't say. Funny old weather we've got. Then France, it'll be good weather. Sunshine as soon as I get there. You're an optimist. Oh, I don't know. In another country, everything seems different. Anything else, sir? Oh, uh, would you just check the oil and battery? Yeah, right you are. They're okay. No, oh, thanks. Yeah. That'll be uh, one pound four and two. Uh, here you are. Look, keep the change. Thank you, sir. Hope it keeps fine for you. Yes, yeah, well. Let's have some music. Be yet another government scam. Damn, wrong station. A murder in Kent. Huh? An elderly woman, Mrs. Mary Ford, was found murdered early this evening in her house on the outskirts of the village of Oastley in Kent. She had been brutally attacked and beaten. The house had been ransacked. And Mrs. Ford was something of a recluse, and it is thought that she kept a considerable sum of money in the house. The police are anxious to interview a man who they believe can help them in their inquiries. Mm. What's that, Dolly? What do you think you're doing, standing in the middle of the road like that? If I hadn't had my eyes open, you'd have been flashing a torch. Well, I didn't see it. I've had a breakdown. I didn't see your car. Well, it's down that little side road you've just passed. A good long way down. <laughs> What's wrong with the car? I hate to say it, but I think the big end's gone. And for me, that's serious. Well, for anyone, I should think. Well, especially for me, old man. Now, look here, can you give me a lift? Oh. I'm getting soaked. There's a transport cafe a couple of miles down the road. If you could drop me off there, I can make a phone call. Well, there's an AA box a mile back. Mm, haven't got my key, old man. All right, then, get in. Many, many thanks. You're a real good Samaritan. Yeah. Dripping over your seat. Sorry. It doesn't matter. Going far? To Dover. Then across to France. Driving off the quay in another country. That's a wonderful feeling. Yes. Lucky chap. Lucky chap. Wish I was coming with you. You married? Uh, no, 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 I'm not. Lucky man. Well, I don't really mean that, you know, but... Uh, when I think of you single chaps... Flat in London, time's your own, do what you like, go where you like. I feel envious sometimes. I didn't say I had a flat in London. And I work too, even if I don't have a regular job. Mm. What's your line then? I'm a writer, a freelance journalist. There you are, freelance, freedom. Oh, brother. Now, I said this breakdown was especially serious for me, and do you know why? Huh? I'm a commercial traveler, one of the knights of the road, and the old buses, my steed, as you might say. Without it, I'm lost. Point is, I must get to Folkestone tonight. I've got an appointment there, first thing in the morning. 
If they can get my car going, well and good. But if not, I'm in trouble. Well, since you were going to Dover... You did say you were. Yes. Well, you won't mind dropping me off at Folkestone, will you? Be the most tremendous help, old man. And waiting five minutes at the cafe while I phone. Phone? About the car. Must do something about it, you know. Make the gesture anyway. Oh, all right. What line do you travel in? Uh, Woolens. All sorts of uh, woolens. You've got no samples. I left my samples case in the car, old man. Didn't want to drag it about with me. And your overnight case, too. Yes, that's right. Used to traveling light, you know. Sleep where I lay my head. <laughs> Shocking business, that murder. What murder? Haven't you heard? Local one. Only a few miles away. Ostly, was it? Old woman had her head bashed in. Nasty business from the sound of it. Well, they'll get the chap, though. Yeah, somebody saw him coming out of the house. Police are anxious to interview Joe Dokes. Yeah, we all know what that means, don't we? You seem to know a lot about it. Well, I'm interested, you see. Are you interested in murder? Well, not so particularly. Mm, I am. And I'll tell you why. Murder is easy. What are you slowing down for? I just passed a sign up there. Single line traffic. Grows up. No, oh, I see. Didn't notice it. Yeah, well, murder is easy, as I say. I mean, look at the two of us in this car. Huh? You give me a lift, but you don't know me from Adam. Nobody sees me get in. I put a revolver in your ribs, tell you to pull over and stop. I shoot you, toss your body out of the car, drive away, leave the car in some town or other. I have to make sure I'm not spotted leaving it, of course. Then take two or three train and bus rides to put the coppers off the scent, and I'm away. With whatever's in your wallet, of course. <laughs> it's been done, you know. I'm a student of crime, and I know. Damn. Sorry, old man, I seem to be putting you off your stroke. Oh, no, I, uh, I was just thinking of the different things you'd leave lying around. Which would mean you'd be caught, you know. Every murderer makes a mistake. Well, fingerprints, for instance. I'm wearing gloves, old man. You didn't notice. <laughs> you must forgive me. I've got a funny sense of humor. Oh. Murder is fascinating, though. You must agree about that. I mean, the psychology of it. A chap goes in a house, bashes up an old woman in the hall, gets her money, what is it, 50 pounds, 100 He's got to live with what he's done for the rest of his life. Do you reckon it's going to worry him? I don't. Uh, a, a tramp at the door. You think that's what it was? The only thing that makes sense, isn't it? But I'll tell you how we'll know. If it was the tramp, the call him that, you know what I mean? The police will get him in a couple of days. He'll have left his dirty paw marks or footprints or something all over everywhere. Everywhere. But now, suppose the chap who did this job is a real artist in murder. Suppose he planned it all out in advance. Hmm. Then you'll find the police are making further investigations. Following up further clues provided by a one-armed farm labourer, that kind of thing. You ever read the Quincy? Murder as a fine art? No, I, I can't say I have. It's got something, you know. Makes you shiver a little bit as you read it. Murder as an art is what interests me. Huh? Oh? Hmm. And the really clever murderer, he just doesn't get caught. <laughs> I don't see how you know. You're right, old man. How could I know? <laughs> <laughs> How could I know? The cafe's just coming up now. Joe's oh, coming. There on the left. That's it. Oh, oh yes, yes, sir. Come on. Uh, look, I've got to get on to Dover. I think perhaps... Don't be more than five minutes in here, old man. I could do with a cup of tar. But... Expect you could, too. Come on, I won't take all night. Hey, 
evening, gents. What'd it be? Two cups of tea, Joe. Nice and strong, the way Mother makes it. And uh, can you do us sausages and chips? Right oh, away. But look here, now, I don't want anything to eat, and I've got to get on. Anyway, I'm not much of a sailor. Plenty of time if you're going for the night ferry. Won't be a couple of minutes. We'll both feel better with something hot inside us. I told you I don't want anything to eat. Mm, very well. Just a couple for my friend here. Right up. I thought you wanted to telephone. So I do. Can I use your phone, Joe? In the corner, mate. Help yourself. Thanks. Uh, Joe? Yes? Uh, you don't mind my calling that? No, no, it's all right. I, I wonder if you happen to have a copy of an evening paper. A lazy issue. Afraid no, I haven't. Very like Charlie has over there. Just brought his truck in a few minutes ago. Charlie, got the paper? Who wants it? Well, I just wanted to, to have a look at it. Oh, yeah. Uh, help yourself, then. It's the late edition. Oh, it should be. I've got it at Maidstone. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, mate. Mm. Let's see. Two teas <coughs> and one sausage and chips. Where's your friend? I suppose he's still telephoning. Oh, but he's not my friend. I just picked him up on the road. Oh, he tried, you know. Wrong time to pick. He says he's had a breakdown. Funny thing, you know, I've got a feeling I've seen him before. He tells me he's a commercial traveller. Yeah, he could be. Don't seem quite right, though. The thing is, he, he talks in a very funny way, almost as if he's drunk. But he's not drunk, or I smell it in his breath. He keeps on talking about... Yeah? About murder. You don't say. Did you have your radio on a few minutes ago? Yeah? The, the news. They said something about a murder in Kent. Yes, yes, I did hear it, that's right. Well, I was wondering if... Oh, here he is. Ah, uh, the old bringers. That's all right for you, then? Lovely grub. Uh, did you make your phone call? Certainly did. I tried a couple of local garages. No dice. And then I rang the AA. They're going to get someone there as soon as they can. But I told them just to tow away the car if they had to, or look after it for the night. I thought I'd go on to Folkestone with you anyway, since you've been kind enough to offer... I see. I mean, it's going on for 11 now, and I don't want to get stranded. Uh, you've got an hotel booked in Folkestone for the night. Yes, that's right. Uh, have you rung them? They won't like you arriving at midnight. I'll tell you what now. It's uh, it's not exactly a hotel. I've got a, a lady friend in Folkestone I'm staying with. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, that's the real reason I want to get to Folkestone tonight. And can you blame me? I suppose not. But I shan't be a couple of minutes now, and then we can be away. I'm not taking you. Not taking me? It won't do, you know, your story. It just won't do. I don't know what you're talking about. I'll tell you. First of all, you're not a commercial traveller. And next... I don't believe you've got a car. Well, how'd you make that out, old man? You say you're a commercial traveller and you've got an important appointment tomorrow morning in Folkestone. Now, I've met one or two commercial travellers and I'll tell you something about them. They're absolutely never parted from their samples case. They're lost without it. Well, naturally they are because they've got nothing to show. But you not only leave it in your car, so you say, but you're not even going to bother to collect it tonight. You could have arranged to get the AA to pass this way and drop the bag in here. You could have arranged for them to take you into Folkestone. Why not? Because you didn't telephone them. You just pretended to make a call. Mm. You don't mind if I use a toothpick, old man, do you? Not at all. Always have to after I eat. The food gets between my teeth. Gaps, you know. Mm. Lots of... Yeah. <laughs> you don't really sound like a commercial traveller, you know. All that talk about being a knight of the road, it's not the way commercial travellers talk nowadays. I'll tell you what you do sound like. You sound like an actor, not a very good actor, playing the part of a commercial traveller. <laughs> no wonder you're a writer. You've got a terrific imagination, old man. Could you do with another cover? I think you'd better listen to me. All right. But a cover makes a good story better. Joe, can we have two more cups of char? Coming up. And then the car. You said you left it a good way down a side road. Now, it wasn't raining all that hard, but you were very wet. 
And just look at your shoes. The mud on them. I'll tell you what those shoes look like. They look as though you haven't been just walking along a road. You've been walking, or maybe running, across fields. Sherlock Holmes! <laughs> Honestly, give over. Here's your tea. Oh, uh, thank you. What's your car number? AKT-113. Make? Mitchell Ensign. Firm? Universal Woolens Limited. Have you got anything on you to show you what you say you are? Well, let's have a look, shall we? Yes, that's. Uh, grocer's bill. Letter from one of my lady friends. I don't think I'll show you that, though. Might shock you. <laughs> Odds and ends. No, I don't seem to have a card. I never carry my driving license about with me, afraid I might lose it. <laughs> a commercial traveller, and he hasn't got a card. Why, without a card, a commercial traveller doesn't exist. Look, I'm not a chap who takes offence easily, old man, but there's a bit beyond a joke. If you've got something to say, some reason why you won't give me a lift in the Folkestone, come straight out and say, what's the point of all this? Right. Ostley, where that old woman was murdered, is only a few miles from where I picked you up. You tell me this cock and bull story about being a commercial traveller. You talk about murder, and you do it in a very queer way. What does that add up to? Not much to But go. I haven't finished the adding up yet. There's still the biggest item to come. Oh, be getting off then, Joe. See ya. See ya. What item? The murder. Poor old Mrs. Ford. How did you know about it? I read it in the paper. Oh, no, my friend. Here's the final edition. Charlie, who's just gone out, bought it at Maidstone. I've looked at it. Carefully. There's nothing about the murder. How could there be when it didn't happen until about seven o'clock? I heard it on the ten o'clock news, happened to switch on the car radio, but how did you hear it? Same way as you. I was in the pub and they had the radio on. I don't believe you. I picked you up, oh, only a couple of minutes after I'd heard it. And another thing. They didn't say anything on the news about her being killed in the hall. The hall. Didn't they? Not a word. Well? Well what? What's the explanation? I told you I was in a pub. That won't do. It just won't do. Maybe it was the nine o'clock news, not the ten o'clock. There is no nine o'clock news. Well, is that so? It used to be. I, I must be behind the times. Hmm. Shall we be getting on, then? Do you really think I'm going to give you a lift after what I've been saying? I'd sooner give a lift to... to a tiger. Well, steady on now, old man. Don't go saying anything you might be sorry for. Are you going to leave me stranded? You've got a nerve. Evening, Joe. Evening, gentlemen. Uh, good evening. Evening, Petso. Bit of the usual time, ain't you? I've oh, got a big load on. Can I have the usual? Two eggs, sunny side up, bangers and chips. Tea coming up. No, I'm going. Just a minute. Let go of my arm. I said just a minute. You want me to telephone the police? I said let go of my arm. What's up over there? Look, gents, if you're having an argument, I'd sooner you had it outside. My friend's a little bit excited, that's all, Joe. Just a question of how far he's taking me. Don't sound much to get excited about. He's an excitable type. I'm not giving you a lift anywhere. Sit down and tell me why. Just tell me why. That's all I ask. Well, I should have thought it was obvious. There's been a murder committed this evening. I pick you up a few miles from where it was done. You're wet, muddy, and you tell me a tale that's complete nonsense. So you think I did it? <laughs> Why not ring the police and tell them? All right, I'll tell you why not. Here you are, Patrick. Where's me bread and butter? Go, oh, coming up. Mm. Tell me then. Uh, can I trouble you gents for the mustard? Help yourself. Much obliged. Say, yes? are you all right? Uh, thank you. Yes, quite all right. Uh, look a bit of a funny colour. Uh, Top of the mustard. 
Why not ring the police? When you've worked everything out so nice and logical. Two reasons. I want to get away now. If I call the police, it means I can't leave England tonight. Perhaps not for, well, not for days. It's selfish. Antisocial, I suppose you'd call it. But I've got to get away. I've just got to. Mm. And the other reason? I don't approve of capital punishment. Hunting people down. Informing on a man to the police. I simply couldn't do it. So you won't shop me, but you won't help me, is that it? That's right. I've got my suspicions, but I don't want to know whether they're right or not. If I'm wrong, there's no harm done. Someone else can give you a lift. If I'm right, then I'm giving you a chance. Even a murderer deserves a chance, is that it? Oh. Are you sure there isn't a third reason? What? What do you mean? We haven't been introduced, have we? My name's Golightly. What's yours? You've forgotten it. Shall I tell you what I think your name is, then? I think it's Richard Martin. What's that? Isn't that your name? Uh... No. <laughs> My name's Grant. Well, let's pretend it's Richard Martin, shall we? And listen while I tell you a story. I'm going. I shouldn't go outside if I were you. Not yet, anyway. Just let me tell you about Richard Martin. It won't take five minutes. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. How was it, Fletcher? Uh, I'll do the old lot again, I tell you. Hey, same again, then. Well, well, no, I don't know. I, I've got to think of my figure. Yeah. Yeah, just make it another cover. Cover coming up. Uh, here we are. You want to keep an eye on those two across there? I've been trying to remember who the big one is. Mm -hmm. And it's... Once upon a time, there was an old lady named Mrs. Ford who lived on her own outside a village called Ostley. Yeah, she was supposed to have quite a bit of money, but she was very close with it, no doubt about that. No sons, no daughters. So what did it matter? Who cared? Well, there was one person who did care. And that was her nephew, whose name was... Had you guessed it? Richard. Richard Martin. Often came down, Richard did, and always trying to get money out of his aunt, or so they said in Oastley. Been convenient for Richard if his aunt had died, wouldn't it? No doubt she's told him she'd left him everything in her will. You know the way close-fisted old people talk. You'll get everything when I've gone, dear. But in the meantime, now I'm afraid I can't pay that bill. But here's a five-pound note to be going on with. Yeah. Very irritating to a young man like Richard, who liked gambling, so they say. He was by way of being a sort of freelance writer. Did I tell you that? A journalist, really. Though people don't seem to think he made much of a living at it. Come on, come on. Well, one fine evening, it was a wet evening as a matter of fact, Mrs. Ford is murdered. Bashed over the head quite brutally, house ransacked, everything turned upside down, made to look like a spur-of-the-moment job. But it wasn't, though. Now, there's a witness who saw the murderer leaving the cottage. What? Didn't know him. The witness is a newcomer to the village, but he said he'd recognise him again in a minute. He described him for us nicely. And this witness not only saw him, but heard him. Heard him? Yes, he, he was whistling. Sky boat song. Catchy tune, isn't it? Favourite of yours. You were whistling it just after you gave me a lift. Shut up! Out of tune, am I? Sorry. Y you said... Described him for us. You're a detective. Detective Sergeant Go Lightly, local CID, at your service. But I don't come in the story yet. I'm coming to me. What we think happened is this. Richard came down hoping to touch the old lady for a bit of money. Got wild when she didn't stump it. Had a row and killed her in, well, the heat of the moment, you might call it. Then he tried to fix things to look as if it had been done by a stranger. Then he haired off back to London and decided to take a trip abroad, which was a bit silly, come to think of it. He'd far better have stayed put. We found out his plans when he rang his flat. The young man he shares it with told us that Richard had decided to go on a holiday abroad quite suddenly. No, 
He was taking the car, going down to Dover. We knew the car number, so Detective Sergeant Go Lightly, poor mug, is detailed off to stand in the road and stop it. He got very wet. We had other people on other roads Richard might have taken doing the same thing. You've got nothing against me. You made a slip, you know. You said Mrs. Ford was killed around seven o'clock. Mm, so she was. But that wasn't in the radio news item. Let me go. I'm going. Now then, Sergeant, watch out. Now then, Joey, I don't want no trouble. They're waiting out there for you. Don't try to stop me. I've got a gun. It's all right. Fatso, look at that bit of glass. Right through the neck. Go like then? Yes, sir. It was Martin, all right, was he? Yes, sir. He made a slip. Mentioned the time she was killed, but there were only the two of us, and of course he'd have denied it. I'd have tackled him in the yeah. car, but I thought he might have a gun. That's why I phoned. You did right. What made him run? I told him there was a witness who'd seen him leave the house. Heard him whistling that song. You remember, one of the villagers said he was fond of it. There was no witness. No, sir. But he didn't know that. And he was fond of whistling. Whistled in the car. I don't like it myself. Bad habit. Can get you into a lot of trouble. Evening. How many? Well, I think I can take, uh... Five gallons. Going on to Dover. How far is it? About 30 miles. There must have been the tank too full. Taking the night ferry. That's right. Tomorrow morning I drive off the quay in France. Start your holiday early in the morning in another country and you get a feeling of, well, you know, of freedom. There's nothing like it. You can do with a bit better weather then. Real old English summer will you have. <laughs> Look at it now. You know, it wasn't raining when I left London. You don't say... Funny old weather we've got. Then France, it'll be good weather. Sunshine as soon as I get there. You're an optimist. Oh, I don't know. In another country, everything seems different. Anything else, sir? Oh, uh, would you just check the oil and battery? Yeah, right, you are. Oh. They're okay. No, oh, thanks. Yeah, that'll be, uh... One pound, four and tuppence. Uh, here you are. Look, keep the change. Thank you, sir. Hope it keeps fine for you. It will. Oh, 30 miles, eh? Let's have some music. Yet another government scandal. Damn, wrong station. 
a murder in Kempton. Huh? An elderly woman, Mrs. Mary Ford, was found murdered earlier this evening in her house on the outskirts of the village of Oastley in Kempton. She had been brutally attacked and beaten. The house had been ransacked. And Mrs. Ford was something of a recluse, and it is thought that she kept a considerable sum of money in the house. But the police are anxious to interview a man who they believe can help them in their inquiries. Mm. What the hell? What do you think you're doing, standing in the middle of the road like that? If I hadn't had my eyes open, you'd have been killed. I was flashing Well, I didn't see it. I've had a breakdown. I didn't see your car. Well, it's down that little side road you've just passed. A good long way down. <laughs> What's wrong with the car? I hate to say it, but I think the big end's gone. And for me, that's serious. Well, for anyone, I should think. Well, especially for me, old man. Now, look here, can you give me a lift? Oh. I'm getting soaked. There's a transport cafe a couple of miles down the road. If you could drop me off there, I can make a phone call. And there's an AA box a mile back. Mm, haven't got my key, old man. All right, then get in. Many, many thanks. You're a real good Samaritan. Yeah. Dripping over your seat. Sorry. It doesn't matter. Going far? To Dover. Then across to France. Driving off the quay in another country. That's a wonderful feeling. Yes. Lucky chap. Lucky chap. Wish I was coming with you. You married? Uh, no, 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 I'm not. Lucky man. Well, I don't really mean that, you know, but... Uh, when I think of you single chaps... Flat in London, time's your own, do what you like, go where you like. I feel envious sometimes. I didn't say I had a flat in London. And I work too, even if I don't have a regular job. Mm. What's your line then? I'm a writer, a freelance journalist. There you are, freelance, freedom. Oh, brother. Now, I said this breakdown was especially serious for me, and do you know why? Huh? I'm a commercial traveller, one of the knights of the road, and the old buses, my steed, as you might say. Without it, I'm lost. Point is, I must get to Folkestone tonight. I've got an appointment there, first thing in the morning. If they can get my car going, well and good. But if not, I'm in trouble. Well, since you were going to Dover... You did say you were. Yes. Well, you won't mind dropping me off at Folkestone, will you? Be the most tremendous help, old man. And waiting five minutes at the cafe while I phone... Phone? About the car. Must do something about it, you know make the gesture anyway. Oh, all right. What line do you travel in? Uh, woolens. All sorts of uh, woolens. You've got no samples. I left my samples case in the car, old man. Didn't want to drag it about with me. And your overnight case, too. Yes, that's right. Used to traveling light, you know. Sleep where I lay my head. <laughs> Shocking business, that murder. What murder? Haven't you heard? Local one, only a few miles away. Ostley, was it? Old woman had her head bashed in. Nasty business from the sound of it. Well, they'll get the chap, though. Yeah, somebody saw him coming out of the house. Police are anxious to interview Joe Dokes. Yeah, we all know what that means, don't we? You seem to know a lot about it. Well, I'm interested, you see. Are you interested in murder? Well, not so particularly. Mm, I am. And I'll tell you why. Murder is easy. What are you slowing down for? I just passed a sign up there, single line traffic, grows up. No, oh, I see. Didn't notice it. Yeah, well, murder is easy, as I say. I mean, look at the two of us in this car. Huh? You give me a lift, but you don't know me from Adam. Nobody sees me get in. I put a revolver in your ribs, tell you to pull over and stop. I shoot you, toss your body out of the car, drive away, leave the car in some town or other. Have to make sure I'm not spotted leaving it, of course. Then take two or three train and bus rides to put the coppers off the scent and I'm away. With 
Whatever's in your wallet, of course. <laughs> it's been done, you know. I'm a student of crime, and I know. Damn. Sorry, old man. I seem to be putting you off your stroke. Oh, no. I, uh, I was just thinking of the different things you'd leave lying around. Which would mean you'd be caught, you know. Every murderer makes a mistake. Well, think of it. I'm wearing gloves, old man. You didn't notice. <laughs> you must forgive me. I've got a funny sense of humor. Oh. Murder is fascinating, though. You must agree about that. I mean, the psychology of it. A chap goes in a house, bashes up an old woman in the hall, gets her money, what is it, 50 pounds, 100. He's got to live with what he's done for the rest of his life. Do you reckon it's going to worry him? I don't. Uh, a, a tramp at the door. You think that's what it was? The only thing that makes sense, isn't it? But I'll tell you how we'll know. If it was the tramp, the call him that, you know what I mean? The police will get him in a couple of days. He'll have left his dirty paw marks or footprints or something all over everywhere. Mm. Everywhere. But now, suppose the chap who did this job is a real artist in murder. Suppose he planned it all out in advance. Hmm. Then you'll find the police are making further investigations. Following up further clues provided by one-armed farm labourer, that kind of thing. You ever read the Quincy, Murder as a Fine Art? No, I... I can't say I have. It's got something, you know. Makes you shiver a little bit as you read it. Murder as an art is what interests me. Oh? Hmm. And the really clever murderer, he just doesn't get caught. <laughs> I don't see how you know. You're right, old man. How could I know? <laughs> how could I know? The cafe's just coming up now. Joe's oh, cafe. There on the left. That's it. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Come on. Uh, look, I've got to get on to Dover. I think perhaps... Don't be it... more than five minutes in here, old man. I could do with a cup of tea. But... Expect you could, too. Come on, won't take all night. What'd it be? Two cups of tea, Joe, nice and strong, the way Mother makes it. And uh, can you do us sausages and chips? Right away. But look here, now, I don't want anything to eat, and I've got to get on. Anyway, I'm not much of a sailor. Plenty of time if you're going for the night, Perry. Won't be a couple of minutes. We'll both feel better with something hot inside us. I told you, I don't want anything to eat. Mm, very well. Just a cup of for my friend here. Right up. I thought you wanted to telephone. So I do. Can I use your phone, Joe? In the corner, mate. Help yourself. Thanks. Uh, Joe? Yes? Uh, you don't mind my calling, sir. No, no, it's all right. I, I wonder if you happen to have a copy of an evening paper. A latest one. Very no, I haven't. Very like Charlie has over there. Just brought his truck in a few minutes ago. Charlie, got the paper? Who wants it? Well, I just wanted to, to have a look at it. Oh, yeah. Help yourself, then. It's the late edition. Oh, it should be. I've got it at Maidstone. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, mate. Mm. Let's see. Two teas <coughs> and one sausage and chips. Where's your friend? I suppose he's still telephoning. Oh, but he's not my friend. I just picked him up on the road. Oh, he's joking, eh? Wrong time to pick. He says he's had a breakdown. Funny thing, you know, I've got a feeling I've seen him before. He tells me he's a commercial traveller. Yeah, he could be. Don't seem quite right, though. The thing is, he, he talks in a very funny way, almost as if he's drunk. But he's not drunk, I smell it in his breath. He keeps on talking about... Yeah? About murder. You don't say. Did you have your radio on a few minutes ago? Yeah. The, the news? 
They said something about a murder in Kent. Yes, yes, I did hear it, that's right. Well, I was wondering if... Oh, here he is. Ah, the old bangers. It's all right for you, then? Lovely grub. Uh, did you make your phone call? Certainly did. Tried a couple of local garages. No dice. And then I rang the AA. They're going to get someone there as soon as they can. But I told them just to tow away the car if they had to, or look after it for the night. I thought I'd go on to Folkestone with you anyway, since you've been kind enough to offer. I see. I mean, it's going on for 11 now, and I don't want to get stranded. You've got an hotel booked in Folkestone for the night. Yes, that's right. Uh, have you rung them? They won't like you arriving at midnight. I'll tell you what now, it's, uh, it's not exactly a hotel. I've got a, a lady friend in Folkestone I'm staying with. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, that's the real reason I want to get to Folkestone tonight. And can you blame me? I suppose not. But I shan't be a couple of minutes now, and then we can be away. I'm not taking you. Not taking me? It won't do, you know, your story. It just won't do. I don't know what you're talking about. I'll tell you. First of all, you're not a commercial traveller. And next, I don't believe you've got a car. Well, how'd you make that out, old man? You say you're a commercial traveller and you've got an important appointment tomorrow morning in Folkestone. Now, I've met one or two commercial travellers and I'll tell you something about them. They're absolutely never parted from their samples case. They're lost without it. Well, naturally they are because they've got nothing to show. But you not only leave it in your car, so you say, but you're not even going to bother to collect it tonight. You could have arranged to get the AA to pass this way and drop the bag in here. You could have arranged for them to take you into Folkestone. Why not? Because you didn't telephone them. You just pretended to make a call. Mm. You don't mind if I use a toothpick, old man, do you? Not at all. I always have to after I eat. Food gets between my teeth. Gaps, you know. Mm. Lots of gaps. <laughs> you don't really sound like a commercial traveller, you know. All that talk about being a knight of the road, it's not the way commercial travellers talk nowadays. I'll tell you what you do sound like. You sound like an actor, not a very good actor, playing the part of a commercial traveller. <laughs> no wonder you're a writer. You've got a terrific imagination, old man. Could you do with another cover? I think you'd better listen to me. All right. But a cover makes a good story better. Joe, can we have two more cups of char? Coming up. And then the car. You said you left it a good way down a side road. Now, it wasn't raining all that hard, but you were very wet. And just look at your shoes. The mud on them. I'll tell you what those shoes look like. They look as though you haven't been just walking along a road. You've been walking, or maybe running, across fields. Sherlock Holmes! <laughs> Honestly, give over. Here's your tea. Oh, uh, thank you. What's your car number? AKT113. Make? Mitchell Ensign. Firm? Universal Woolens Limited. Have you got anything on you to show you what you say you are? Well, let's have a look, shall we? Yes, that's. Uh, grocer's bill. Letter from one of my lady friends. I don't think I'll show you that, though. Might shock you. <laughs> Odds and ends. No, I don't seem to have a card. I never carry my driving license about with me. I'm afraid I might lose it. A commercial traveller, and he hasn't got a card. Why, without a card, a commercial traveller doesn't exist. Look, I'm not a chap who takes offence easily, old man, but this is a bit beyond a joke. If you've got something to say, some reason why you won't give me a lift in the folks, then come straight out and say, what's the point of all this? Right. Ostley, where that old woman was murdered, is only a few miles from where I picked you up. You tell me this cock and bull story about being a commercial traveller. You talk about murder. And you do it in a very queer way. What does that add up to? Not much to But go. I haven't finished the adding up yet. There's still the biggest item to come. Oh, begin it off then, Joe. See ya. See ya. What item? The murder. 
poor old Mrs. Ford. How did you know about it? I read it in the paper. Oh, no, my friend. Here's the final edition. Charlie, who's just gone out, bought it at Maidstone. I've looked at it. Carefully. There's nothing about the murder. How could there be when it didn't happen until about seven o'clock? I heard it on the ten o'clock news. Happened to switch on the car radio. But how did you hear it? Same way as you. I was in the pub and they had the radio on. I don't believe you. I picked you up, oh, only a couple of minutes after I'd heard it. And another thing. They didn't say anything on the news about her being killed in the hall. The hall. Didn't they? Not a word. Well? Well what? What's the explanation? I told you, I was in a pub. That won't do, it just won't do. Maybe it was the nine o'clock news, not the ten o'clock. There is no nine o'clock news. Well, is that so? It used to be. I, I must be behind the times. Hmm. Shall we be getting on, then? Do you really think I'm going to give you a lift after what I've been saying? I'd sooner give a lift to... To a tiger. Well, steady on now, old man. Don't go saying anything you might be sorry for. Are you going to leave me stranded? You've got a nerve. Evening, Joe. Evening, gentlemen. Oh, uh, good evening. Evening, Petso. Bit of the usual time, ain't you? Oh, I've got a big load on it. Can I have the usual? Two eggs, sunny side up, bangers and chips. Tea coming up. I'm going. Just a minute. Let go of my arm. I said just a minute. Do you want me to telephone the police? I said let go of my arm. What's up over there? Look, gents, if you're having an argument, I'd sooner you had it outside. My friend's a little bit excited, that's all, Joe. Just a question of how far he's taking me. Don't sound much to get excited about. He's an excitable type. I'm not giving you a lift anywhere. Sit down and tell me why. Just tell me why. That's all I ask. Well, I should have thought it was obvious. There's been a murder committed this evening. I pick you up a few miles from where it was done. You're wet, muddy, and you tell me a tale that's complete nonsense. So you think I did it? <laughs> Why not ring the police and tell them? All right, I'll tell you why not. Here you are, Patrick. Where's me bread and butter? Go, oh, coming up. Tell me, then. Uh, can I trouble you, gents, for the mustard? Help yourself. Much obliged. Say, yes. are you all right? Uh, thank you. Yes, quite all right. Uh, look a bit of a funny colour. Uh, Top of the mustard. Why not ring the police when you've worked everything out so nice and logical? Two reasons. I want to get away now. If I call the police, it means I can't leave England tonight. Perhaps not for, well, not for days. It's selfish. Antisocial, I suppose you'd call it. But I've got to get away. I've just got to. Mm. And the other reason? I don't approve of capital punishment. Hunting people down. Informing on a man to the police. I simply couldn't do it. So you won't shop me, but you won't help me, is that it? That's right. I've got my suspicions, but I don't want to know whether they're right or not. If I'm wrong, there's no harm done. Someone else can give you a lift. If I'm right, then I'm giving you a chance. Even a murderer deserves a chance, is that it? Oh. Are you sure there isn't a third reason? What? What do you mean? We haven't been introduced, have we? My name's Golightly. What's yours? You've forgotten it. Shall I tell you what I think your name is, then? I think it's Richard Martin. What's that? Isn't that your name? Uh, no. <laughs> My name's Grant. Well, let's pretend it's Richard Martin, shall we? And listen while I tell you a story. I'm going. I shouldn't go outside if I were you. Not yet, anyway. Just let me tell you about Richard Martin. It won't take five minutes. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. How was it, Petra? <laughs> I can do the old lot again, I tell you. Yeah, same again, then. No, 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 I, no, no. I, I've got to think of my figure. Yeah. Yeah, just make it another cover. Cover coming up. 
Uh, here we are. You want to keep an eye on those two across there? I've been trying to remember who the big one is. Mm -hmm. And it's... Once upon a time, there was an old lady named Mrs. Ford who lived on her own outside a village called Ostley. Yeah, she was supposed to have quite a bit of money, but she was very close with it, no doubt about that. No sons, no daughters. So what did it matter? Who cared? Well, there was one person who did care. And that was her nephew, whose name was... Had you guessed it? Richard. Richard Martin. Often came down, Richard did, and always trying to get money out of his aunt, or so they said in Osley. Been convenient for Richard if his aunt had died, wouldn't it? No doubt she's told him she'd left him everything in her will. You know the way close-fisted old people talk. You'll get everything when I've gone, dear, but in the meantime, now I'm afraid I can't pay that bill but here's a five-pound note to be going on with. Yeah. Very irritating to a young man like Richard, who liked gambling, so they say. He was by way of being a sort of freelance writer. Did I tell you that? A journalist, really. Though people don't seem to think he made much of a living at it. Come on, come on. Well, one fine evening, it was a wet evening as a matter of fact, Mrs. Ford is murdered. Bashed over the head quite brutally, house ransacked, everything turned upside down, made to look like a spur-of-the-moment job. But it wasn't, though. Now, there's a witness who saw the murderer leaving the cottage. What? Didn't know him. The witness is a newcomer to the village, but he said he'd recognise him again in a minute. He described him for us nicely. And this witness not only saw him, but heard him. Heard him? Yes, it was whistling. Sky boat song. Catchy tune, isn't it? Favourite of yours. You were whistling it just after you gave me a lift. Shut up. Out of tune, am I? Sorry. Y you said... Described him... For us. You're a detective? Detective Sergeant Go Lightly, local CID, at your service. But I don't come in the story yet. I'm coming to me. What we think happened is this. Richard came down hoping to touch the old lady for a bit of money. Got wild when she didn't stump it. Had a row and killed her in... Well, the heat of the moment, you might call it. Then he tried to fix things to look as if it had been done by a stranger. Then he haired off back to London and decided to take a trip abroad. Which was a bit silly, come to think of it. He'd far better have stayed put. We found out his plans when he rang his flat. The young man he shares it with told us that Richard had decided to go on a holiday abroad quite suddenly. No. He was taking the car, going down to Dover. We knew the car number, so Detective Sergeant Go Lightly, poor mug, is detailed off to stand in the road and stop it. He got very wet. We had other people on other roads Richard might have taken doing the same thing. You've got nothing against me. You made a slip, you know. You said Mrs. Ford was killed around seven o'clock. Mm, so she was. But that wasn't in the radio news item. Let me go. I'm going. Sorry, Sergeant, watch out. Now then, Joey, you don't want no trouble. They're waiting out there for you. Don't try to stop me. I've got a gun. Stop your Let go. Let go. It's all right. In fact, so look at that bit of glass. Right through the neck. Go lightly. Yes, sir. It was Martin, all right, was he? Yes, sir. He made a slip. Mentioned the time she was killed, but there were only the two of us, and of course he'd have denied it. I'd have tackled him in the yeah. car, but I thought he might have a gun. That's why I phoned. You did right. What made him run? I told him there was a witness who'd seen him leave the house. Heard him whistling that song. You remember, one of the villagers said he was fond of it. There was no witness. No, sir. But he didn't know that. And he was fond of whistling. Whistled in the car. 
I don't like it myself. Bad habit. Can get you into a lot of trouble. Today's play was recorded in the 1960s and is set in England. We present Max Adrian in W.S., adapted for Adia uh, from the story by L.P. Hartley. W.S. <laughs> I'd like a picture of Porfa. You have always been so interested in Scotland, and that is one reason why I am interested in you. I have enjoyed all your books, but do you really get to grips with people? I doubt it. Try to think of this as a handshake from your devoted admirer, W.S. Well, that's all it says, Dodson, and there's a colored view of Porfa on the other side. Very nice, if everything isn't really that color. <laughs> I wish I had a devoted admirer or two. <laughs> you have a wife and two children, or is it three? It is. Oh, they're devoted enough, I suppose. I rather think you'd be stretching it a bit to class them as admirers. <laughs> if you know, I was only talking about it with Ellis Black down at the club the other day, deploring the lack of direct contact between the writer and his public. Here you are. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. And saying how satisfying it must be to stand up on a stage and to see them there and hear them applauding you. And giving you the raspberry. You'd have to have it both ways. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, I don't think I'd mind even that. Here I sit, cooped up with a typewriter and a ream of tour paper for six, nine, twelve months. And what's the end of it? A book which looks strange even to me when I see it for the first time in print with a ghastly wrapper no one's even consulted me about. And after that... An occasional glimpse of a copy in a bookshop. Always one copy, I may say, flanked by half a dozen of somebody else's. <laughs> and a procession of steadily diminishing royalty statements at seemingly interminable intervals. It's all so, so remote. Oh, well, the only thing left is to write a play. Then you can go before the curtain on the first night and make a speech and they'll clap you. There you are, I've hit it. First, write your play. I've tried. Oh, it's a different art. No purple passages of description. All character. Character. And to quote your friend from Forfa, do you really get to grips with people? Yes. He says he doubts it. Do you? Oh, I don't know. And then, and then there could be something in it, I suppose. I'll admit that the thing I'm least happy with is a rule. Why? The, for always me. Or just the opposite of how I see myself. <laughs> well, I must hand it to my devoted admirer in Forfa. He's a perceptive critic. Somebody does care about you, you see. Do you get many letters? Oh, few. Do you reply to them? Yes. I'm very particular about that. Mind you, I don't get off two pages by return post, like I would have done at one time. Still, I do let them have an acknowledgement of some sort, at the very least. So what will you say to Mr. W.S.? Oh, nothing, I'm afraid. He doesn't give any address on either of them. Either? Oh, then this isn't the first time he's written. Yes, this was the first. Well, there's been another since, though. Only yesterday. Well, I think it's here somewhere. Yes. Here it is. A picture postcard again. Forfa? No, very on Tweed. <laughs> With Streeter through Scotland. <laughs> Oh, think of the dreary hours and hotel bedrooms you're helping to while away for some poor traveller. Now, there's justification of your work for you. Well, a curious character. Listen to this. What do you think of Berwick on Tweed? Like you, it's on the border. I say, that's going a bit No, wait, he goes on. 
I hope this doesn't sound rude. I don't mean that you're a borderline case. You know how much I admire your stories. Some people call them otherworldly. I think you should plump for one world or the other. Another warm handshake from W.S. Oh, he believes in being frank. Or she. A woman? Oh, I'd hardly think so. Uh, let's see the handwriting. Well, it looks like a man. I'm inclined to agree. On the other hand, it's, it's like a woman to probe. I mean, to want to make me feel at the same time flattered, but unsure of myself. And has W.S. succeeded in that? Up to a point, yes. What's this about your stories being otherworldly? I shouldn't have thought. Neither should I, in all fairness to myself. I don't say, mind you, that I plant my feet quite firmly on the ground all the time. I'm rather an escapist, you know. But that seems to be the novelist all over these days. That's exactly what I tell myself when I catch myself at it. So W.S.'s remark isn't personal, quite. No. No. Another drink, old man. Oh, I have to drive, remember? My devoted admirers will be wondering where I got to. <laughs> well, what is it for you this evening? Club or typewriter? Oh, far side, I think. With a book. By someone else. <laughs> Good idea. Oh, I say, this November's colder than last, isn't it? Oh, so it seems to me. Uh, cheers. Cheers. Uh, are you writing anything much at present? Oh, the odd thing... Well, no, no, nothing much. One of those temporary ruts, you know. Excuse me, sir. Oh, uh, yes, Mrs. Kendall. Are you, you off now? Uh, yes, sir. I've left your meal all ready for when you want it. Ah, that's very kind of you. It's all right, sir. Oh, and there's this card for you. It must have fluttered down under the hall table in the afternoon delivery. I've just caught sight of it when I went to get my coat. A card? Oh. Oh, I'll be going then, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, Doctor. Good night, Mrs. Kendall. Uh, uh, yes, uh, good night. Uh, I must be going, too. No. Just a moment. Hmm? It's another. Not W.S. Yes, York Minster this time. Take a look. York Minster? I know you are interested in cathedrals. I'm sure this isn't a sign of megalomania in your case, but smaller churches are sometimes more rewarding. I'm seeing a good many churches on my way south. Are you busy writing, or are you looking round for ideas? Another hearty handshake from your friend W.S. Well, I'm dead. You're, you're sure you won't have another? No, I mustn't. I say, though, all this about cathedrals, why? Uh, of course, he's, he's quite right. I am interested in cathedrals. Are you? Uh, especially, I mean. I once wrote a fantasy about Lincoln Cathedral. Oh, years ago. I did a piece about it in a travel book once, too. I didn't know. I didn't know anyone knew. first wasn't published, and the second wasn't signed. And you know, I am inclined to undervalue parish churches. Or something to do with size. Cathedrals move me by their size. I've always felt it. Well, I don't think you're alone there. I never stopped to think about it myself. I have. This W.S. seems to... to know I have. Dodson, who the hell is he? You're sure it isn't a joke? Any of your more frivolous friends travelling south from Scotland just now? Not that I know of. Well... The initials, W.S. Are you sure they don't ring a bell? Well, I've thought about that already. I, I can't see any connection. W.S. William Shakespeare? Oh, hardly. W.S. Gilbert? Still before your time. W.S. Morm. William Somerset Morm. Oh, I somehow don't see Somerset Morm sending me picture postcards from anywhere. No. Well... I found three W.S.'s for you, and all writers. Now, there's a thought. Ah, oh, forget about it. You've always told me what a jealous crew writers are. Perhaps this is one of them trying to rattle you from sheer jealousy. Oh. Now, think of a writer. Not of the front rank, of course. With the initials W.S. <sighs> this is futile. 
Of course. Oh, what now? Well, disregarding what I said about not being of the front rank, W.S. Walter Streeter. You. Oh, really, Doc. That's it. As soon as I leave here, you'll be out of the house and in a taxi to King's Cross. You'll take the first train to, to Leeds or Bradford or somewhere, scribbling a card as you go. You'd have bought the card here, of course, because there'll be nowhere open when you arrive. You post the card when you get there, take the next train back, and here you are again in the morning waiting for the postman. I see it all. Dodson, this, this doesn't strike me as funny, you know. And that's just your trouble, if I may say so. What you need, old boy, is a holiday. All this concern over a sticky patch in your work can't quite come to grips with your characters, stories a bit out of this world. Nothing at all that a ten-mile walk in the country air wouldn't cure. Aren't you forgetting something? What? Uh, I must be off. That I didn't write those postcards. And that W.S., whoever he or she may be, did. My dear fellow, it's all quite plain. They are written by a woman, just as you thought. Now, I'm sure it's a woman. She's probably fallen in love with you and wants to make you interested in her. I should pay no attention whatsoever. Well, people in the public eye are always getting letters from lunatics. If they worry you, destroy them without reading them in future, if there are any more. That sort of person is often a little psychic, and if she senses that she's getting a rise out of you, she'll go on. Perhaps. Uh, perhaps you're right. My most devoted admirer thinks I'm always right, <laughs> so long as I keep on agreeing with her. Uh, no, I'll see myself out. Huh? And don't worry so much. Morning, sir. Oh, good morning. There's a packet wouldn't get through the box. Oh, thank you. And a card. Oh, that's a lot. Good good morning. Morning, sir. I'm coming nearer. I've got as near as Coventry. Have you ever been sent to Coventry? I have. In fact, you sent me. It isn't a pleasant experience, I can tell you. Perhaps we shall come to grips after all. If I've given you any new ideas, if I have, you ought to thank me, for they are what novelists want, I understand. I have been re-reading your novels, living in them, I might say. Je vous serre la main. As always, W.S. And there were two cards before these from Bericon Tweed and... Uh, Corfa. I'm sorry, Inspector, but I burnt them uh, just after my friend Mr. Dodson left me yesterday evening. Pity, but I don't think they'd have helped us much. You said you received the one from York while Mr. Dodson was still with you, though. What made you keep that one? Well, I'd only glanced at it. I wanted to read it more carefully. Then, well, somehow I thought I would keep it to show to someone... You, I suppose. And the Coventry one arriving this morning made up your mind for you? Yes. Well, you did the right thing, sir. If you knew the number of poison pen letters that get written but never come anywhere near our hands... Is that so? Oh, yes. I must admit, Inspector, I... I hesitated. Well, I thought you might... <laughs> laugh. Laugh, sir? Well, it's... Anonymous letters are never a laughing matter to me. However, I... I think you should set your mind at rest about these cards of yours. Oh, you do? You say you're quite sure there's no one likely to be bearing a grudge against you? I've no cause to think there would be. Well, then, in my opinion, there are hoax. Don't ask me why anyone should decide to play a hoax in this form, I don't know. It seems to me, uh, well, uh, a, a literary matter, if you see what I mean. Uh, I think so. At a guess, and it is only a guess, I'd say your friend Mr. Dodson hit the nail on the head. Some dotty woman who'd read all your books and... Perhaps read more into parts of them than you intended. Has to write you about them. Uh, and this is the only form she's managed to hit it off in. I see. So you think it unlikely that she'll ever show up in person? Very unlikely indeed, sir. If she was that sort, she'd have given an address and angled for some sort of a reply. Ah, oh, yes, sir, of course. Well, Inspector, I'm very much obliged to you. You've taken a weight off my mind. Very pleased to help, Mr. Streeter. You'll find they'll dry up before long. Uh, you'll let us know if you get any more, though. Oh, oh quite. Most certainly. Uh, 
I hate to trouble you twice within 24 hours, Inspector. I know how much you have to do. But it came by this morning's post, and I, I thought it best to bring it to you at once. Well, never mind about that, Mrs. Reader. It would help us more if everyone acted as promptly as you. Uh, then take a seat, won't you? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, may I see it, please? Oh, yes. Uh, here you are. It's it's a picture of Gloucester Jail. Gloucester Jail? Well, <laughs> I'm blessed. I used to be down that way myself. Yes, I remember that all right. I never knew they made cards of that sort of thing. Oh, yes, yes. Morbid fascination, you know. Oh. Now, let's see what she has to say this time. I am quite close now. My movements, as you may have guessed, are not quite under my control. I'll say they aren't. York, Coventry, Gloucester. It's a pretty roundabout route to London. Very. But all being well, I look forward to seeing you sometime this weekend. Then we can really come to grips. I wonder if you'll recognize me. It won't be the first time you've given me hospitality. T. Stringo Lamano, as always, W.S. Yeah. Inspector. Mr. Shreedy, you'll forgive me asking, but you're quite sure you've been altogether frank about this thing? Frank? Of course I've been frank. I wonder if you'll recognize me. It won't be the first time you've given me hospitality. Hardly the sort of thing you'd expect from a complete stranger. Well, now, look here, Inspector. Uh, had... Now, now, sir. I'm sorry, but if you mean to imply... I that... imply nothing at all, sir. We, we see a little of everything in this job, you know, sooner or later. And when it comes to the matter of a, a lady, well, uh, w what I mean is... Well, there has never been anything of the sort. Very good, sir. Then I take it that you've still no idea whatsoever who W.S. could be. None at all. Only... Uh, yes? Well, you consider this absurd, but I might as well tell you. After I left you yesterday, I went over and over in my mind as to whether there could be anyone with a sort of grudge against me. I should perhaps tell you that I'm not a man of strong personal feelings. Such feelings as I have go into my books. Sublimation. Very useful, too. <laughs> exactly. Well, in my books, I've drawn some pretty nasty characters in my time. Well, not of recent years, however. Recently, I found myself reluctant to draw a very bad man or a woman. I feel it's, well, morally irresponsible and artistically unconvincing, too. You follow me? Yes, yes. But in the past, though, when I was younger and more inclined to see things as black or white, I let myself go once or twice. I remembered last night about a character in one of my very early books. The Outcast, it was called. A character into whom I really got my life. And was... Uh... No, wait. I wrote about this man with extreme vindictiveness, just as if he were a real person I was trying to show up. I can still remember the curious pleasure it gave me to attribute every kind of wickedness to him. I never gave him the benefit of any doubt, never felt a twinge of pity for him, even when I made him pay the penalty for his misdeeds on the gallows. By the time I'd finished that book, I was so worked up about the idea of this dark creature that I felt almost frightened. I can understand how that could be. I don't remember my early books awfully well, so I took down this one last night and turned the pages. It was only then that I remember the man's name. It was William Stainsforth. Will you? W.S.? My own initials. Pure coincidence, of course. Naturally. I only tell you this because it explains why I came hurrying round to you this morning. Our talk yesterday had left me feeling so much better, relieved, until this absurd coincidence cropped up and weakened my resistance again. When this last card came through the box this morning, I was almost glad to be given the excuse to come round and see you. <clears throat> and uh, you leave here relieved again, I hope. Oh, yes, much better for the talk. And now I must let you get on with more important things. Oh, well, we are kept pretty busy, you know, sir. Never too busy to help them. But uh, take my word for it, this hoax has just about played itself out. I'll be very surprised indeed if you clap eyes on Mr. or Mrs. W.S. this weekend or any other time. Well, I sincerely hope not. But uh, speaking of the weekend, though... Yes, sir? Uh, well, I thought... I wondered, just in case, whether one of your men in the vicinity couldn't, oh, well, perhaps keep a bit of an eye on my place. Just in passing, perhaps. Ooh, well, hmm. Well, 
Well, yes, I, I dare say we could manage that. Yeah, yes, of course. <laughs> then you've relieved my mind completely. We'll do the best we can, Mr. Streeter. Can't have your mind taken off your work now, can we? <laughs> what do you know, Inspector? I feel more like working today than I've felt for weeks. You don't know how grateful I am. Oh, don't mention it. Good day, sir. Good morning, Inspector. That was Tuesday morning, Dodson. Tuesday morning to Sunday evening. That's five and a half days without a sign of a card. Oh, bully for the inspector, then. Your practical jokers packed it in. Mind you, I was still a bit worried after that last talk. But I decided the best thing was to make myself work and forget it all. And you know, I've worked solidly ever since. Good stuff, too, although I say it myself. You see? I've hardly been able to tear myself away from the typewriter to eat my meals. So, have you rung up the police and told them not to bother? I thought about it, but I decided to leave it over the weekend. Oh, well, they've made their arrangements anyway. Nothing elaborate. They're too short-handed. I didn't see a policeman as I came along the street. No, oh, but there was one there earlier. Standing at the corner. Helmet and <laughs> all. Oh. No. He's not there now. I thought for a moment of going along and asking him to come in for a cup of tea or a drink. Yes. <laughs> You're quite your old self again, my dear chap. Oh, but I was nearly forgetting. I'm just on route to the club. I popped in to see if you'd join me. Oh, no, 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 thanks, old man. I must keep at it. Oh, on Sunday evening? Oh, it's going too well. I feel good for another thousand words or so before I turn in. I, I tell you what, though. Mm -hmm. Call in for a nightcap on your way home. I'll have done as much as is good for me by then. Jolly good. I look forward to that. Till later, then. Till later. Yes. <laughs> Helmet and all. I didn't realize how cold it was. I like the gas fire. Ah! Won't you take your taps off and make yourself at home? Good Lord. Are those snowflakes on you? I didn't realize it was snowing. I can't stay long. I got a job to do, as you know. Oh, yes. Such a silly job, I'm afraid. Well, I suppose you know what it's about, the, the postcard. Uh-huh. Nothing can happen to me as long as you're here. I shall be as safe, uh, as safe as houses. Well, stay as long as you can and uh, have a drink. I never drink on duty. Ah, so this is where you work? Yes, I was writing when you rang. Mm, some poor devil's for it, I expect. I, I beg your pardon. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Mr. Streeter? Yes? Inspector Hatchie. Ah, uh, good evening. Just rang to ask how everything is at your place. All right, I hope, sir? Oh, splendid, splendid. That's good. I rang because I'm sorry to say we weren't able to do that little job we were going to do for you after all. Dreadfully short-handed this weekend, I'm afraid, sir. But... But you did send someone. No, oh, sir, I'm afraid we couldn't manage. But... but there's one here. In this very house. No. No, I, I can't. I see. Would you like us to send somebody now? Y yes. Uh, please. All right, then. We'll be with you in a jiffy. Uh, uh, constable. Had you forgotten I was a policeman? What? You are a policeman. I've been other things as well. Thief. Pimp, blackmailer, not to mention murderer. You shouldn't know. I, 
I don't know what you mean. Why do you speak like that? I've never done you any harm. I've never set eyes on you before. No, haven't you? But you've thought about me and you've written about me. You got some fun out of me, didn't you? Now I'm going to get some fun out of you. You made me as nasty as you could. Wasn't that doing me harm? I... You didn't think what it would feel like to be me, did you? You didn't put yourself in my place, did you? You hadn't any pity for me, had you? Well, I'm not going to have any pity for you. But I tell you, I, I don't know you. And now, now you say you don't know me. You did all that to me and then forgot me. You forgot William Stainsforth. William Stainsforth? Yes. I was your scapegoat, wasn't I? You unloaded all your self-dislike on me. You felt pretty good while you were writing about me. Now, as one W.S. to another, what shall I do if I behave in character? Huh? I don't know. You don't know. You ought to know. You fathered me. What would William Stainsforth do if he met his old dad in a quiet place? His kind old dad who made him swing. You know what he'd do as well as I. No. No, you don't. Because you've never really understood me. I'm not so black as you painted me. You never gave me a chance, but I'm going to give you one. That shows you never understood me, doesn't it? Yes. If you can tell me of one virtue you ever credited me with, just one kind thought, one redeeming feature, yes. then I'll let you off. And, uh, and if I can't... Then that's just too bad. We'll have to come to grips. And you know what that means. You took off one of my arms, but I've still got the other. Stains for the iron arm, you called me. No. So start thinking. I, I you, can't. You've got one minute. How could you expect me to think? I no use this. No use. Then if you won't help yourself. <laughs> I, I don't care. Do what you must. No. There's nothing to be said for you. Of all your dirty tricks, this is the dirty. <laughs> you want me to whitewash you, do you? How dare you ask me for a character? I've given you one already. God forbid I should ever say a good word for you. I'd rather die. Then die. Ah! <laughs> Inspector, is he... I'm afraid so, Mr. Dodson. Still warm, but quite dead. But how? Strangled. See the marks on his throat? Yes. I see them. And look. His hand's crushed. Crushed. Inspector. Yes, sir? There are... Aren't those... Snowflakes on him? Snowflakes? By Jove. I left the club early. So I walked all the way back here. It's a beautiful night. Not a cloud in the sky. W.S. by L.P. Hartley... Adapted for radio by Michael and Molly Hardwick. The streeter was played by Max Adrian and Dodson by Simon Lack. Other parts were played by Vivian Chatterton, John Brining and Leslie Perrins. The producer was Charles Lefeu. W.S. by L.P. Hartley. Adapted for radio by Michael and Molly Hardwick. The streeter was played by Max Adrian and Dodson by Simon Lack. Other parts were played by Vivian Chatterton, John Brining and Leslie Perrins. The producer was Charles Lefeu. <laughs> I did myself record this trial in cipher during its progress but have not until this time brought it before the world because of certain singular passages in the evidence thereof. But now those are gone that might speak ill of me for my note-making. 
for the prisoner's friends had made interests with Judge Jeffreys, before whom the case was heard, that no report should be put out. But indeed it matters little, seeing that there is to this day a piece of land hard by the town, fenced off and never built upon, called Martin's Close, by reason of this very crime. On Wednesday, the 19th of November, George Martin, the prisoner, being in Newgate, was brought to the bar. George Martin, hold up thy hand. The indictment brought against you setteth forth that you, George Martin, not having the fear of God before your eyes, but being mused and seduced by the instigation of the devil, upon the 15th day of May, in the 36th year of our sovereign lord, King Charles II, with force and arms in the parish of Zealford in Devonshire, in and upon Anne Clark Spinster at the same place, of your malice aforethought did make an assault, and with a satin knife, value one penny, the throat of the said Anne Clark then and there did cut, of the which wound the said Anne Clark then and there did die, and the body of the said Anne Clark did cast into a certain pond of water situate in the same parish, against the peace of our sovereign lord the king, his crown and dignity. My lord judge, I pray you that I may see a copy of this indictment. What is this? Surely the prisoner knows that is never allowed. Besides, here is as plain an indictment as ever I heard. You have nothing to do but to plead to it. My lord, I apprehend there may be matter of law arising out of the indictment, and I would humbly beg the court to assign me counsel to consider of it. Besides, my lord, I believe it was done in another case. Indeed? What case was that? Truly, my lord, I have been kept close prisoner ever since I came up from Exeter Castle, and no one allowed to come at me. I cannot tell your lordship precisely the name of the case, but I... Oh, this is nothing. Name your case, and we will tell you whether there be any matter for you in it. God forbid that you should have anything that may be allowed you by law. But this is against law, and must keep the course of the court. My lord, we pray for the king that he may be asked to plead. Are you guilty of the murder whereof you stand indicted, or not guilty? I am not guilty. Calfred, how wilt thou be tried? By God and my country. God send thee a good deliverance. Why, how is this? Here has been a great to-do that you should not be tried at Exeter by your country, but brought here to London. And now you ask to be tried by your country. Must we send you to Exeter again? My lord, I understood it was the form. So it is, ma'am. We spoke only in the way of pleasantness. <laughs> well, go on and swear the jury. So they were sworn. There was no challenging on the prisoner's part, for, as he said, he did not know any of the persons called. Then the usual charge was delivered to the jury, and the case opened by the junior counsel for our Lord the King. Then followed the Attorney General, Sir Robert Sawyer. May it please, Your Lordship, and you, gentlemen of the jury, I am of counsel for the King against the prisoner at the bar. Now, to open the matter to you orderly. About Christmas of last year, this gentleman, Mr. Martin, having newly come back from the University of Cambridge, some of his neighbours entertained him here and there at their Christmas merrymakings. So it happened that he came to the place where this young girl lived with her parents and put up at the new inn there, a place of good repute. Here was some dancing going on, and Anne Clark had been brought in by her elder sister to look on. But being of weak understanding and very uncomely in her appearance, it was not likely she should take much part in the merriment. The prisoner, seeing her, asked her, it would seem by way of a jest, whether she would dance with him. Fair as damsel, will it please your ladyship to dance with me? <laughs> she understands not, you say. She's a simpleton. Truly, I see she's proud and haughty. Yet will she not lend me the light of her eyes? Oh, you're a mocking fellow, master. Leave Anne alone, I say. By your leave, mistress. Will you dance with me, madam? <laughs> so, I can't dance. Oh, come away, now. Nay, I can't believe those pretty feet have no skill in dancing. Why not make the essay with me, madam? <laughs> <laughs> there, you see? The very song. 
I will give you the keys of heaven. I will give you the keys of heaven. Madam, will you walk? Madam, will you talk? Madam, will you walk and talk with me? Uh, uh, such a pretty gentleman. Oh, don't be a fool, Anne. He mocks at you. Let go, will you? I can sing, sir. I can sing, too. Is there I will walk? Is there I will talk? Is there I will walk? And talk for Bravo! Bravo! And pinch you black and blue if you don't come away this minute! Let me back! Let me my fun sweetheart! <laughs> See me dancer. I will give you the keys of my heart, and we'll be married till death does It's right, I will. My lord and gentlemen, I will shorten my tale so far as to say that from that night on, there were frequent meetings between the two. For the young woman was greatly tickled with having got hold of so likely a sweetheart, and he being in the habit of passing through the street where she lived, she would always be on the watch for him. And they had a signal arranged that he should whistle a tune well known in that country. It has a burden, Madam, will you walk, will you talk with me? Oh, yeah. I remember it in my own country in Shropshire. Well, go on, Mr. Attorney. For some three or four weeks after this meeting with Anne Clark, the prisoner became contracted to a young gentlewoman, one suitable every way to his own condition. But within no very long time, this young gentlewoman, hearing of the jest that was going about with regard to the prisoner and Anne Clark, signified to the prisoner that the match between them was at an end. Upon receipt of this news, the prisoner was greatly enraged against Anne Clark as being the cause of his misfortunes, and upon meeting with her, both threatened and abused her and struck at her with his whip. But she, being a poor innocent, could not be persuaded from her attachment, but would run after him, testifying with gestures and broken words the affection she had to him, until she was become, as he said, the very plague of his life. Uh -huh. Then was it, Madam, do not walk and talk with me, eh? <laughs> Such, my lord, was the posture of things up to the 15th day of May in this present year. Upon that day... The prisoner comes riding through the village and met with the young woman. But in place of passing her by, he stopped and said some words to her with which she appeared wonderfully pleased, and so left her. And after that day, she was nowhere to be found. <laughs> it was noticeable that at this time the prisoner's carriage and demeanor changed, and it was said of him that he seemed a troubled man. And it, uh, it also appears... Well, well, Mr. Attorney, come, what is your instance? My lord, it is a strange one, and I cannot call to mind the like of it. Uh, but to be short, we shall bring you testimony that Anne Clark was seen after this 15th of May, and that at such time as she was so seen, it was impossible she could have been a living person. <laughs> silence! Silence in court! Uh, Mr. Attorney, you might save up this tale for a week. It will be Christmas by that time, and you can frighten your cookmaids with it. <laughs> God, man, what are you prating of? Ghosts and Christmas, jigs and tavern company, and here's a man's life at stake. And you, prisoner, I would have you know there is not so much occasion for you to make merry neither, for I perceive you laughing. Now go on, Mr. Attorney. I shall show you, my lord and gentlemen, that Anne Clark's body was found in the month of June in a pond of water with the throat cut, that a knife belonging to the prisoner was found in the same water, and that he made efforts to recover the said knife from the water. And so, we will proceed to call our evidence. Call Sarah Ascot. Sarah Ascot. Sarah Ascot. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Your name is Sarah Ascot? It is. What is your occupation? I keep the new inn at Sealford. 
Do you know the prisoner at the bar? Yes. He was often at our house since he come first at Christmas of last year. Did you know Anne Clark? Yes, very well. Was she comely? Oh, no, not by no manner of means. She was very uncomely, poor child. She had a great face and hanging chops and a very bad colour like a paddock. What is that, mistress? What say you she was like? Uh, my lord, I ask pardon. I, I heard Squire Martin say she looked like a paddock in the face and... So she did. Uh, paddock. Can you interpret her, Mr. Attorney? My lord, I apprehend it is the country word for a toad. Oh, oh a, a hop toad. I, I, go on, go on. Will you give an account to the jury of what passed between you and the prisoner in May last? Sir, it was this. It was about nine o'clock in the evening after the dam did not come home, and I was about my work in the house. There was no company there, only Thomas Snell and... It was foul weather, and then I said to Thomas, "Yer be more company." Why, Squire Martin, tis a bad night for you to be out of doors. Devil's weather. Give me a drink. Aye, indeed. Will you have ale, sir? Ale? No, no. I'll have wine. The best you have. Aye, a good claret, sir. That'll warm your bones. And have you been out looking for your sweetheart, Squire? My sweetheart. Zones, woman, what do you mean to talk to me of sweethearts? Watch your tongue. Why, Squire, here's a change of tune. Madam, will you want... Da, 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 da. Stop that cursed doleful tune, will you? Nice, Squire. I thought was your favourite of yours. Here's your wine. Thomas will keep you company while I fetch some hot water from the kitchen. Da, 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 da. I stir knife on these, Squire. Huh? Knife? Oh, yeah, I don't think so. It tends to cut my twist, see? For I'm minded to a pipe of tobacco, and my teeth are very full, as your honour can uh, see. Aye, aye, very well. I oh, could find it. I thought it was in my coat. Yeah, I'm sure it is. What? Have you lost your knife, Squire? Good God. I must have left it there. Give you a coach and six, six black horses as black as pit. Tis the wind. No, tis Aunt Clark. I must tell Squire this minute. Squire, Squire Martin. Well, what's to do? Why, here's your sweetheart back again. I heard a voice just now from the kitchen. Shall I call her in? Poor thing out in that storm. Old woman! In God's name! Come away from that door! What? Are you not glad to see the poor child is found? Thomas Snell, if Squire won't let me, do you open the door and call her in? Ah, gladly, Bernard. Anne! Anne, come in, child! There. Now that candles are blown over and we're left darkling. Shut the door, Thomas, quick. Uh, I have her tinderbox about me, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, ah, your test. Shh. What was that? Great cupboard yonder. Aye. I thought so too, but twas fast shut. Oh, twas the cat may be in the kitchen. Ah. Ah, there's a light. Now the candles, Thomas. But where's Squire? Squire, what ails he? Well, Swooned dead away, I'm Squire. Look, all white and sweaty. Oh, my God. Lord, save us and keep us. What's that? Oh. What, sir? There. Something like a bit of cloth showing under the cupboard door. What if... if someone have run in while the light was quenched? Nay. We would hide in the press. Only at children's games. Tis some stuff you had there already. I keep no cloth in it. Or naught but jars and flasks. Well, take a close look. See what it is. A bit of black stuff. 
like a cloak on the edge of a brown dress. Uh, uh, Shall I see the squire, sir? Thomas, no. I know you like the look of this no more than I do, but think not to dodge away, for I need your help. Aye, sir. Then stand by and catch anyone that comes out when I open this cupboard door, for there's someone hiding within and I fain know what she wants. No, no, I don't want to see it. For the Lord's sake, let me out. Let me go. Let him go, great coward. No, Thomas. The cupboard door. Thomas, I'm afeard. Thomas. Thomas. And pray, mistress, what came out? A mouse? No. A, 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 a hop toad? No, my lord, Twas greater than that. But I could not see what it was. It fleeted very swift over the floor and out the door. But what did it look like? Was it a person? My lord, I cannot tell what it was, but it ran very low and it was of a dark colour. We were both daunted by it, Thomas Snell and I, but we made all haste we could after it to the door that stood open, and we looked out. But it was dark, and we could see nothing. Were there no tracks of it on the floor? There was an appearance of a wet track on the floor, but we could make nothing of it. And besides, it was a foul night. Hmm. <laughs> what took you the cloth or stuff to be that was below the edge of the cupboard? I took it to be a woman's dress. Did you know anyone who wore such a dress? It was common stuff by what I could see. Was it like Anne Clark's dress? She used to wear just such a dress, but I, I could not say an oath was hers. Did you feel of it, mistress? No, my lord, I didn't like to touch it. Didn't like? Not why that? Are you so nice that you scruple to feel of a wet dress? Indeed, my lord, I cannot very well tell why, only it... Had a nasty, ugly look about it. Oh, so, so. Mm -hmm. Well, mistress, well, you've told your tale well. Must I say more? Get down, get down. His lordship has done with you. Well, Mr. Attorney, for my part, I see not what you would do with this evidence, although to be sure she tells an odd tale. My lord, we bring it to show the suspicious carriage of the prisoner immediately after the disappearance of the murdered person. And we ask the jury's consideration of that. Oh, well, 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 well. Yeah. Let's hear more. Then was called a boy, William Redaway, about 13 years of age. Now, child, don't be frighted. There is no one here will hurt you if you speak the truth. Aye, if he speak the truth. Speak out, boy. Where were you on the evening of the 23rd of May last? Oh, Mr. Attorney, what, what, what does such a boy as this know of days? Can you mark the day, boy? Yes, my lord. It was the day before our feast, and I was to spend six months there, and that falls a month before Midsummer Day. My lord, we cannot hear what he says. I can't hear, but we'll set him up on the table there. Oh, well, boy, and where wast thou on that day? Keeping cows on the moor, my lord. And what befell? I was sitting behind a bush of firs near the pond, and Squire Martin came very cautious and looking about him with something like a long pole in his hand and began to fill in the water with the pole. And then, child? Why, I heard as if the pole struck against something that made a wallowing sound. And Squire dropped the pole and threw himself on the ground and rolled himself about with his hands to his ears and after a while got up and went away. Had you any speech with the prisoner? No, sir. But a day or two before, he asked me if I had seen a knife laying about and said he would give sixpence to find it. Did you note anything about the pond water? Only that it began to have a very ill smell and the cows would not drink of it. Had you ever seen the prisoner and Anne Clark in company together? Aye, several times since Christmas. I saw her run after him, but he would not speak with her. Were you sure it was she? Yes, quite sure. How quite sure, boy? Because she would stand and jump up and down and crap her arms like a goose. What was the last time you so saw her? I... <laughs> come, come, boy, that halfway to a man. Let's have none of this puling. A very master parson, come up to him. Uh, fear not, William. These are things that must be found out. 
But I'm so afraid, Parson. And I like not to speak of it. Courage, my child. God will support thee in medieval. May I stay by him, my lord? Aye, I do, do, do. He is better now, sir. Now, William, tell us of this time you saw Anne Clark. Please you, it was the day after I had seen Squirt at the pond. I see something dark come up out of the water at the far side and so up the bank. And it, it stood up and flapped its arms up and down and ran off very swift, the way Squire Martin had taken. Now, boy, you have told us you know the nature of an oath. Upon your oath, what took you this thing to be? Upon my oath, sir, it could be nobody but Anne Clark. Silence in court! My lord, we have done with our evidence for the king. Then let the prisoner make his defence. Speak out, Mr. Martin. My lord, I... I know not what a splendid feeble than the boy. Speak up, man. My lord and gentlemen, I hope you will not go about t to take my life on the evidence of a parcel of country folk and children that will believe any idle tale. And I would say that I have been much prejudiced in my trial. What is this, fellow? You've had singular favour shown you in having your trial removed from Exeter. What prejudice is this? I meant not that, my lord, but rather that since I was brought to London, there has been no care taken to keep me secured from interruption and disturbance. How is this? Is the marshal present in court? Here, my lord. How say you? Has the prisoner any just complaint of his safekeeping? Nay, my lord. Only one thing comes to my mind, that I had word from my underkeeper of a person that was seen outside his door and going up the stairs to it, I know not which. What person was that? Of what favour? My lord, I I cannot speak of it, save, save by hearsay, which is not allowed as evidence. That is true. Prisoner, was this the interruption you speak of? No, no, my lord, I know nothing of that. But it is very hard that a man should not be suffered to be quiet when his life stands upon it. So, so, so. Well, what witnesses do you call, prisoner? None, my lord. None, you say? None. You call no witnesses? Whereupon the Attorney General spoke to the jury, and after the Lord Chief Justice summed up the evidence, saying that he had never heard such given in his experience, but that there was nothing in law to set aside, and that the jury must consider if they believe these witnesses or not. Then the jury retired to consider their verdict, and after a very short consultation returned. Jurymen, how say you? Is the prisoner guilty of the fact whereof he stands accused, or not guilty? Guilty! Prisoner at the bar, have you anything to say in arrest of judgment? My lord, the indictment is at fault and not proper. How so? It sets out my name spelt with an I, whereas it is correctly spelt with a Y. Therefore, I am not the person indicted. By your leave, my lord, this is not material. I have evidence that by times the prisoner wrote his name as it was laid in the indictment. And here is a letter of his to prove it. Let me see it. What a plague is this darkness and obscurity at two in the afternoon. Have you no lights here? Lights for my lord chief judge. No, 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 it's no matter. My eyes are good enough to see this paper. Hmm? Yeah. The indictment stands. Prisoner, you hear this? Have you nothing further to offer? No, my lord. What see you in the corner of the court that you fix your eyes on it and not upon me, your judge? Nothing, my lord. Then give me your attention. I hereby pronounce upon you sentence of death that you be returned to the place from whence you came and there confined, that you be taken from thence and hanged in chains upon a gibbet as near as may be to the spot where the fact was committed, and that this execution shall take place upon the 28th day of December ensuing, that being a holy innocent day, and a fitting one for the taking off of one that hath foully murdered an innocent. My lord, m my lord, I have one plea to beg of you. Well, what is that? That some of my kinsfolk or friends be allowed to come to me in my confinement during the short space I have to live. Aye, with all my heart. So it be in the presence of the keeper. 
That Anne Clark may come to you as well, for what I care. Hey, for God's sake, my lord, use not such words to me. Have mercy, mercy. Thou deservest no mercy at any man's hands. A cowardly, butchery murderer that hath not the stomach to take the reward of his deeds. I say Anne Clark may come to you now, for all I care. And I hope she will be with you by day and by night. Until an end is made of you. No, 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 no. She's here. You've told her. Keep her off me. Keep her off. No, 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 no. And today's play was recorded in the 1950s and is set in Italy. We present Howard Marion Crawford and Brian Wilde in The New Catechum, adapted for radio from a short story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The New Catechum. Bentley, sir, got my message. Come along in. Oh, thank, thank you, Kennedy. Then you had up. Now, what's in your bag? Oh, a few odd things I thought might interest you. Right, eh? Bring him to the study. But you know my motto, pleasure before business, let's have a drink first. <laughs> all, all right, thank you. So long as you don't expect me to keep pace with you. <laughs> Come along in. Oh, warm tonight, isn't it? Well, it's soft and pretty warm at this time of the year in Rome. I like it, anyway. Do you mind if I open a window? Oh, that's the idea. You open a window and I'll open a bottle. It's fair division of labor. <laughs> oh, come on, you broke. <laughs> have, you, have you seen the continental edition of the Courier? No. Well, it said I want to see you about. No, I'm afraid I've been working all day in my room. Oh. Well, now, we've got something to celebrate. Oh, Salute. Cheers. C cigarette? Yeah. Oh, no, of course you don't. Well, what do you mean? We've got something to celebrate. Now, now, you listen to this, my lad. Uh, where is it now? It's in the gossip. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 here we are. I'm told the two young Englishmen in Rome are shedding new light on an old subject. Archaeology, it seems, isn't the exclusive province of old gentlemen with long beards and short sight. <laughs> I like that bit. <laughs> uh, um, oh, yes. Now listen to this, Len. Edmund Kennedy's recent daring reconstructions of the Baths of Caracalla has excited admiration and controversy. Uh, I hear that savants are heading for Rome to see the wonderfully imaginative model he has made. The ingenuity he has displayed may well give fresh impetus to the science of antiquities. Uh, another Englishman in Rome, Charles Benchley, is working on the theory that there are fresh discoveries to be made under the foundations of the Eternal City. It is generally agreed that the ancient catacombs, the underground cemeteries in which the early Christians buried their dead, have long since yielded up their last secret. But Benchley, I hear, is stubbornly pursuing his idea that there are fresh underworlds to be conquered. So far, without result. Now, where are you going? Well, I, well I, I, I think it's pretty cheap stuff. I, <laughs> it, it was quite inaccurate. It's full of feeble little cracks and cliches. I mean to say, the eternal city, yeah. new light on an old subject. Oh, this is smart Alec journalism. Oh, oh, not that I'm belittling the work you've done, only... Only no, what? Well, I think that this sort of thing only cheapens our work. I wonder where the paper got hold of this stuff. I thought perhaps you might have inspired it. I? Good heavens, no. 
Oh, no, I, I, I assure you, Kelly, I, I'd never dream of such a thing. No, I believe that our, our sort of work should be done almost by stealth until we are ready ourselves to publish results. Oh, I don't know. A little bit of publicity never did anyone any harm. Besides, it's expected nowadays. <laughs> I'm a brilliant young man, Benchley, and my, oh, what was it, uh, my ingenuity and imagination have given fresh impetus to interest in archaeology. <laughs> well, damn it, man, why should film stars get all the limelight? Aren't we doing work of lasting value? By unraveling the past, we forecast the future. No, no, here's two publishers a day. <laughs> perhaps you're right. Uh, I expect I'm too diffident. Yes, of course you are. Uh, if you're not careful... You're going to develop into one of those old men with long beards and short sight who practically live at the British Museum. <laughs> well, certainly I sometimes wonder how long I shall stick it in Rome. Oh, to be in England now that October's there, huh? Yes, I suppose so. Well, that's not how I see it. I like Rome, I like my work, and I like my freedom. Do you honestly tell me you'd go back to the stuffy conventions of the suburbs? Well, there's... There's a good deal to be said for the suburbs. There's a good deal too much said in the suburbs, if you ask me. <laughs> what would the neighbors say if they saw you sitting at a table in, well, Streatham High Road drinking Chianti? <laughs> well, it would be a little unusual, wouldn't it? Exactly, but it isn't here. And the girls, my dear fellow. Oh, the girls. <laughs> How many flashing-eyed charmers would you count on a tour around Tooting Beck Common? <laughs> Quite a number, surely. <laughs> oh, no, you wouldn't. But in Rome. Ah. Now, I must say Italian women appeal to me. That one in Ricci's bar, huh? The beautiful Lucia with the luscious curves. Oh, I, I don't think I've Lamore. spoken to an Italian girl since I came here, except the servants, of course. Well, why not make the best of both worlds, as I do? Don't you believe when they say you can't have your cake and eat it, you can, you know. You can. Yeah, but, but, but I'm not much good at philandering, besides it. Costs a lot of money. Yeah. And you're pretty lucky, you know, Kennedy. I mean, private income and all that. Look, look at this flat. A real apartamento discreto. Hey, it's nice, isn't it? I doubt if there's a better in the city. One could say that you had everything. Reputation, money, uh, good, good looks. I'm afraid I envy you sometimes. Well, I'm not complaining. <laughs> well, really, I'm, I'm not complaining either, though. You'd laugh if you knew how many lira I spend per month on my camera per una persona. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I oh. say, don't, don't think I ought to have any more. Go on, man, oh. you're only young one. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. Oh, oh, thanks, that'll do. I, I say, Kennedy. Yeah? There's something I rather want to mention to you. Go right ahead. I had lunch today with Gregory. Oh, that ass. He said something about you that I... A pretty strong exception to. In fact, I got very angry with him. Oh, I wish I'd been there to see you angry. Oh, no, you'd be surprised. I... Well, go on. I know Gregory doesn't like me. Well, what did he say? Not that I give a damn. Oh, oh perhaps I'd better shut up. <laughs> it's the wine. <laughs> well, he began to talk about that pretty English art student who didn't come back to Rome after the vacation. Which art student? Mary Sutherland. Oh, no, that, that, that's not her name. Uh, uh, oh, Sanderson, isn't it? What did Gregory say? He told me to ask you where she was. Then he went on to tell her, well, an unpleasant story about her. I must say I got damned annoyed with him, and I told him I didn't believe a word of it. That's very loyal of you, but I still don't know what he said. I'd like to... Well, he said that you took Miss Sanderson for a, a holiday and then abandoned her said she went back to England broken-hearted because you refused to carry out your promise to marry her. He said there was a deal of scandal being talked He got it all wrong. Well, I told him I wouldn't believe it. But you can't afford to let Gregory go about spreading slander like that. You ought to do something about it. Shut him up or, or prosecute well, him. Why should I trouble to anger with thought? Oh, it's none of my business, of course. I merely thought that if you didn't contradict such lies, people will assume that they're true. Now, why should I care? <laughs> If Mary and I had a burned-out love affair and parted by mutual consent, that's our business, isn't it? Well, of course. Love, my dear fellow, is a big word. It covers a great many shades of uh, feeling and emotion. Mary's a sweet and charming girl, and we decided it was simply a passing affair. Well, we, we, we did have a wonderful time together at Bellagio and Lake Como. That was a lovely place, especially in the spring. Per nell'are 
Teddy. Mm. I'm so glad we came here, aren't you? Yes, Mary. Don't you think this is the most beautiful place in the whole world? Yes, it's pretty good, I must say. <laughs> pretty good. That's a nice piece of understatement. Just go around in a circle, darling, so that I can see Bellagio, then Catanapia, then Verena, without even having to stir off my car. Mm-hmm. when we have to leave tomorrow. No, that's not quite true. Even perfection has to come to an end, eh? Go ahead, I agree. In a way, darling, I'm anxious that this perfection should come to an end. Are you? Yes. What you said to me when we first fell in love is quite true. You remember you called me a Puritan? So I did. You were quite right. That's what I am at heart, a conventionally-minded Puritan. I've been happy here in a kind of way, but I shan't be really easy in my mind till we reach London and get married. Uh, uh, um, uh, look, Mary, I, I want to talk to you about this. Oh, I know what you're going to say. A few perfunctory words spoken over our heads by the parson can't possibly change him. I know that, sir. But I still want to have the words spoken over him. Uh, darling, certain um, complications have cropped up. Complications? Yes, I I can't possibly go to London with you, I'm afraid. I, not at present, anyhow. That was the arrangement, Teddy. Mother and father expect us on Wednesday. Yes, yes, I know, I know. But I, I shall have to ask you to go on alone tomorrow from Milan while I go back to Rome. Well, of course, I'll join you later. But I don't want to turn up without you. I'll wait till you can come. What happened? That letter I had on Friday, I... Well, I, I didn't want to spoil our holiday by telling you, but it was from Professor Voss of Berlin. He's coming especially to see me in Rome next week. But you can put him off for a few weeks. What a man of bosses, Danny. It would seriously damage my career not to meet him. Your career? Doesn't occur to you that you're damaging mine? Teddy, you can't possibly mean this. But they're getting ready at home. Yes, I said I'd carry out my promise later. Don't say that as though you had the slightest intention of doing it. I couldn't believe you'd treat me in this way. I can't believe it yet. Teddy, what do you mean? Now, don't start to get excited and make a scene. I'm only asking you to wait a little, and then I'll come to London and... Teddy, are you backing up? Mary, I wish you'd try to be sensible and listen to me then carefully. Then the whispers in Rome were true. Hmm? I see now that Richard Gregory was trying to warn me. What are you me. talking about? And I didn't have the slightest suspicion of you. I thought you were in love with me. Well, of course I was. Was? Well, I think you must see for yourself that we aren't quite as keen on each other as we thought. How easy you must have found it. It never occurred to me to believe that you could say all those lovely things and not mean a word of them. Well, we were attracted to each other at first. You asked me to marry you and said you'd come home with me and meet my parents and have the wedding in London. Look, Mary, we might as well face. Then you had a brilliant idea. On our way home, you said, why not let's have a week at the most wonderful and beautiful place in the world, the Lazio. Well, you're perfectly agreeable. Perfectly agreeable. Is that all you can say? I really don't see the need for all this drama. Now, we've had our holiday and we're not going to be married. Another conquest for Mr. Kennedy. I've already said I'll come as soon as I can get away. My work is very important. That's what I, I thought of my life and my future. Rather important to me. But they don't seem to mean anything to you. Well, of course they do. Will you come back to Rome in September? I shall never come back to Rome. Never. But I hope I shall never see you again. Oh, say, look here, Mary. Put me ashore, please. I think you're behaving in the most extraordinary way. Put me ashore. What are you going to say about the coma? My dear Benchley, when you know a little more about the world, you'll realize that a man doesn't discuss this sort of thing. Oh, I see. I'd say no more about it. Now then, what about opening your case and seeing those specimens of yours, eh? Oh, yes, certainly. Hmm, I say. What are these? Oh, tiles. Mm, I thought they'd interest you. But where did you get them? In a place I found. Forgive me, but I'd prefer not to be more explicit at this moment. And what's this? Bottle? That's what I'd say. But it's... 
It's cruder than anything I've ever seen. Oh, my view exactly. And the... The incisions on these inscriptions. I've never seen characters like them before. Surely they're very early and primitive. My dear chap, it's the most exciting place. Crude, primitive, yes. Those are the words. I don't believe that any eyes except mine have seen this place for... Oh, for many centuries. Is it true, then, that you've discovered a new catacomb? Yes. Are you sure that it isn't in Bosio's standard work? Positive. Well, well, this is going to put you on the map, eventually. Perhaps. I, I don't know. That's not the aspect of the thing that interests me at the moment. But how do you come to light on it? Damn it, man, I thought that every catacomb in Rome had been catalogued a hundred years ago. Is it just an odd, undiscovered gallery no, in one of these... It's a complete new catacomb. It's quite... Oh, it's, it's quite enormous in extent and incredibly complicated. I've known of its existence now for quite some months. I stumbled on the clue by accident when I was in the university library. Yes, hold well, on. Well, there are treasures down there that no one but myself has ever seen. Marvelous and foreign. Mostly perfect. There are some tremendously interesting murals that I, I haven't had time to inspect properly yet and a, a perfectly wonderful chapel somewhere near the center of the whole warren. It's hopeless to try to describe the place. It must be seen to be credited. All right, let me see. Oh, I... No, I, I, I'm sorry, Cleverly, but I, I can't quite bring myself to let anybody in on this one. Not quite yet. Then why did you mention it at all? Oh, it's silly of me. I know I expect this excellent spumante of yours is responsible. But damn it all, old boy, you can surely trust me. I'd be the last man on earth to blab about it to anyone. Well, well, well you... you know my ideas. Say nothing to anyone until you're sure of your conclusions. But from what I gather, it would take one man years to explore and catalogue the place. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, that's right, years. In fact, it, it, it couldn't be done by one man, never. There's miles of it. Miles. Well, where about it? It's near the great aqueduct. <laughs> Sounds like a discovery of the first important. These inscriptions alone will make a sensation. Basically, you're a lucky devil. Well, not exactly lucky. I, I've worked on the thing rather hard for some time. I must tell you how I lighted on the entrance. It's quite a detective story. Mm -hmm. Well, well, tell me. No, it would take too long. Not, not tonight. Oh, it's too bad, rousing my curiosity like this. I, if I'd been lucky enough to be the discoverer, I'd have taken you into my confidence. You really? Of course. Well, I don't want you to think I've distressed you. Well, 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 then, just let me take one look at you. Oh, really, Kennedy, you're awfully persuasive. No, right? come on, come on. I, I, I tell you what. I'll let you blindfold me as soon as we get near the place. Would you? Uh, certainly. And you can do the same after we leave. Now, is that fair enough? Well, I don't know. I... Well, perhaps I wouldn't mind showing you the catacomb under those conditions. <laughs> no, it sounds childish. Good, 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 fine. Well, what, what, what are we waiting for? Let's go. You mean tonight? Well, of course, why not? Oh, oh but I, I haven't come prepared. What do you need? Well, not, nothing really except a good torch. Look in that drawer over there. Oh. I got a flashlight there that throws a terrific beam. Oh, yes. Oh, the very thing for the job. Well, you don't seem to have an excuse left. No, I don't, do I? But I must say, I hadn't intended to. Oh, well, all right, then. Actually, I'm quite keen myself. I haven't been down for a couple of days. How do we go, Jackson? Uh, no, I think not. If you don't mind, I'd rather walk. I've been inside all day and a little fresh air. Oh, I'm fine. Walk suits me. Let's move then. Oh, it seems an awful time of night to go, but... Oh, well, all right. Can I take this damn handkerchief off now? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, thank good. Well. Well, where on earth are we? It's an abandoned cow shed. <laughs> I rented it from the owner, and I keep the place padlocked, as you see. And the entrance to the catacomb? Is it inside here? Mm, under the straw here. If you'll hold the torch. All right, thanks. There. Uh, So this is the entrance. Yeah, there are 20 steps down, but wait a minute first. I've got to put my harness on. Oh. 
So that's what all this roller towel <laughs> arrangement, all the stout <laughs> string on it is. Well, you see, as the catacomb is still largely unexplored, but it's a perfect rabbit warren, I take this precaution. Uh -huh. You tie this string on my twist, you see, like this. Yes. And no matter where I wanted to, I could be sure of getting back. <laughs> that's ingenious. Well, I had some pretty narrow escapes at first until I got some hang of the layout. Mm. There's an incredible number of passages which divide and subdivide in a, in a most bewildering way. How do you find your way at all if it's so complicated? Oh, well, there's a certain system to it, of course. And I, I've made a few marks of my own here and there to guide me. Yeah. I'm pretty expert in getting around nowadays, but if a stranger blundered down here, I wouldn't give a button for his chances. Ah, oh, well, I'm ready. Now, give me the torch, will you? Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, let's go down. entrance chamber that, well, there are at least a dozen passages radiating from here for a start. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, where do we go? Oh, this way. Now, don't let's loiter to look at things meantime, because the real marvels are in the central chapel, and it's quite some distance away. Oh, what a place. Cracked brown walls and rows and rows of tombs. Here, here, wait a minute. Let's look at this. You see this inscription here? Pax, uh, what is it? Pax Tinkle. Ah. Uh, here's another one. Perhaps TV. This is certainly a very early, early place. Oh, I think it may prove to be the earliest of them all. But let's push on. There are far more wonderful things to be seen. Ah, oh, you know your way around here beats me. The passage is everywhere. The place is an absolute labyrinth. It, it, it gets more confusing further on. Yeah. Now, round this way. Hey, wait, wait a minute. What's this on top of this tomb? A bracelet? Oh, yes. Oh, but I can show you mirrors and... And then combs and armlets and, and, and earrings and buckles and brooches, not all the usual domestic paraphernalia left by relatives near the tombs of their friends. Well, oh, of course, the usual toys and dice and money jars, some with coins in them. But this is marvelous. Oh, I wish we could stop it. No, 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 not this visit. Uh, no, 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 wait a moment. Um, no, I'm with it. Yes, we turn, we turn left here. <laughs> it's funny, but this little bit always baffles me for a moment. Oh, this discovery will actually make your name. Yes, perhaps. Now, come on. Oh, wait, is this a wall painting? Yes. Oh, but it's nothing compared with what I show you. Now, oh, keep pressing on, Kennedy, please. You know, all this is small stuff so far. There's rather a fine tomb over there. Yeah. We'll have a closer look on the way back. Yes. This is far more wonderful than Santa Inez. Oh, undoubtedly. Uh, to the right, yeah? Huh? Uh, don't loiter. Please, Kennedy. Yes, I've well, done it all, man. It's so tempting. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, I'll lose you. <laughs> hey, wait. Right. Oh, that's bad. This is utterly awesome. bewildering. Now, down this little slope, huh? Now, now steady. Right. Right. 
Yes, I will. Thank you. Well, the battery in your torch is a good one. Yes, it's new, thank goodness. Oh, we've been spotted with one out. Oh, uh, there's always this train. <laughs> well, how far are we going? Seems to have come quite a long way already. Well, let us measure the distance, but uh, it's a goodish way before you reach the centre. Mm. I've never yet discovered the limits of the place. Now, don't talk to me for a minute. This is the most difficult place of all. Uh, yes, yes, this way. It's not too far now. Well, this beats me. I've never seen such a network of intersecting passages. I can't, really, I can't think how you know you ever. Oh, well, I've practically lived down here for the last three months. Uh, now, in a minute, we come to the place I've been talking about. Uh, it's a large circular hall with a great square pedestal of porous rock topped by a slab of marble. Here we are. Look. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Why, that's a twist, you know. That's what I think. It might be a little first one of its kind of existence. I hope it may be. Look, shine, shine your, your torch on the end of the marble lobby. There? Yes. Right. Look. Here is a little consecration cross right in the corner. Ah, yes. Precisely the whole was used at the church. It may be one of the very first to exist. Precisely. Now, now look at some of the bodies buried in the niches of the wall. Huh? Go, go on, look at them. They, they'll surprise you. Yeah. It's unique, I think. When we get this place explored and mapped out, it'll cause a sensation. The very earliest Christians must have worshipped here when their religion was still prescribed. Yeah. That's why they made the labyrinth so unusually complicated, of course. Mm. As a rough guess, I'd say that there are about a, a thousand possible wrong turnings between this wall and the entrance. What? Oh, that's a sobering thought. <laughs> you know, you've no idea what real darkness is like. Until you get down here. I tried it once as an experiment and it scared me stiff. <laughs> Look, I, I'll just switch off the light for a moment and let you see. <sighs> That's horrible. It's not just an ordinary darkness, is it? It, it seems to press on you. It almost mothers you. That'll do, basically. Switch on again. You, you sound quite funny. Switch on the light, man. <laughs> no, wait a minute first. Do you notice how, when the light's off, you lose all idea of where sounds are coming from? Yes. Yes, I do. Your, your voice seems to be coming from, from every, every side of me. <laughs> Switch on the light, man. No. No, I don't think I will. I think I, I need you in the dark to find your own way back. What? Good God, man, have you gone mad? Not at all. I'm not a devil you're playing yet. This is not a damn nonsense. Where are you? Where are you? Don't hurry, Kennedy. You've all the time in the world. And when you sit down occasionally for a rest, just ask yourself whether you treated Mary Saunders and Perry. Mary Saunders? Saunders? What is this? What are you saying? Where are you, man? You seem to be getting further away. Put on the light! I know a deal more about Mary's ruined life than you think. I was in love with her. And just on the point of overcoming my shyness and asking her to marry me when you took her away on that little holiday to the Togo. For the God's sake, man, you... You slipped out of that hole pretty easily, didn't you, Kennedy? Now see if you can get out of this one. Oh, oh no. The basement... He can't. <laughs> Bentley! Can't do it, my God. Bentley! 
In The New Catechism by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted for radio by R.J.V. Seller, Kennedy was played by Howard Marion Crawford, Benchley by Brian Wilde, and Mary by Pauline Yates. The producer was R.D. Smith. In The New Catechism by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted for radio by R.J.V. Seller, Kennedy was played by Howard Marion Crawford, Benchley by Brian Wilde, and Mary by Pauline Yates. The producer was R.D. Smith.